How's it going? Good. Are we recording? Yep. All right. We know what we're doing. Do you? Do you want to do that thing? Sure. All right. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we have Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast, whether that's Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, SoundCloud, any other ones that are out there, Ben? Did you say YouTube? You did. YouTube is separate. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for, uh, you know, just engaging with us, sending us comments, questions, concerns, emails. If you want to reach out to either myself or Ben, you can always email us, Tom at RealRecoveryTalk.com and Ben at RealRecoveryTalk.com. And ultimately, what we're trying to do, Ben, is uh, help you turn your mess into your message. Yes, sir. We do. I have a we have a couple of emails to get back to. Do we? I'm falling behind a little bit. Oh, yeah. We got a nice one this morning. Did you see that? I did. Yeah. She gave us a uh, or she wanted to give us a re- uh, review. And it was a nice review. Mm-hmm. It's good. Yeah. Made me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, Tom. So for those of you that don't know, Ben and I celebrate the same birthday, April 7th, 1984. We both blessed this world with our presence. Ben was uh, born a few hours earlier than me, and uh, so therefore he always says he's older and wiser, but the verdict's still out on that. I was going to say something. I'll keep to myself. (laughs) All right, so... uh, on this episode, we um, Ben had a good idea on uh, something that he wanted to bring up. He actually brought this to my attention this morning, and I said, yeah, I think it's a g- great idea. Um, so, Ben, I'll let you just kind of get right into it, and uh, we'll just take it from there. Go ahead. So, I'll preface with this. I wanted to share my experience with my first ever time in an actual treatment center. I had previously gone to a sp- a state funded place carp here in West Palm beach for detox. I'm not really counting that. Like I did detox only. There was no beds afterwards, but the first time I ever actually went to a full program with the full continuum of care levels of care, PHP, IOP, et cetera. Looking back, knowing what I know now, I want to talk about some things that you should not see in treatment. Knowing what I know now, the experience that I had was really not good. There are some key points that I will bring up, and I'll just call it what it is. There are good treatment centers out there, and there are some ones that are not the best. I'll just say that. Um, and, in this, and this is not about bashing. I've, I've gone through in my head a Rolodex of events that I'll share with you. And I think, Tom, you'll definitely be able to chime in on this stuff. Um, but I think it's worth sharing because this may help someone looking for treatment ask questions, so to speak. We did an episode a long time ago. I don't know what episode number it was. It was years ago. And I, I believe it was just me. And I and I did a episode on basically what questions to ask when looking for a treatment center and kind of broke it down, um, you know, with some of the main questions that you ask whenever you're looking for treatment for yourself or for somebody else. So this is kind of uh, going to be more of an in-depth if you or somebody that you know is looking for treatment. These are kind of the things that you want to look out for. And uh, yeah, so let's just start off, Ben, with what what are you thinking number one is here? So I'll preface this. I, uh, I went to treatment the first time and Yeah, we'll call it my first time. It was my first real experience with treatment in an actual treatment center outside of a state-funded place that I just detoxed at. So I was 20 years old and primarily drinking, doing cocaine, Roxy's, tiny, tiny bit of heroin at the time, uh, you know, ecstasy, stuff along those lines. But at that point in time, I was drinking to the point where I had basically burnt my esophagus. I I sat down at the bar one night, took a sip of beer at the end of my bartending shift, and it felt like fire going down. Did it like shoot out your throat? No, not quite. But I I realized at that second, I'm like, oh my God, this is really bad. Um, And I had a roommate that was into doctor shopping, 
with the Oxys and the Roxys, the painkillers down here in Florida at that time. So I went home and that's really when my opiate addiction kind of took off. So I was like on the on the precipice of of full blown alcoholism, alcohol in particular, a lot of cocaine and the, the Oxycontins um, were really kicking in. And so I go to this treatment center. My my parents, I had insurance at the time. Um, insurance back then, this was probably in 2003 or four. Insurance really didn't cover substance abuse too much back there. There were very few policies that did. That didn't happen until a few years later. Um, but this, I guess it covered what it could. And then my parents helped pay some cash to help get me into a center. And I will say this, I genuinely wanted to be sober very, very badly. So I want to just kind of jump into it. I went there and I had an open mind. I wanted to learn everything I could. Again, I reiterate, I genuinely had the desire to be sober and to get help. And looking back, I can honestly tell you, I was screaming for help when attending this treatment center. And in many cases, just not just didn't get it. Now, let me give you some ideas of what this looked like and why knowing what I know now as a professional in this field, this is why at Rock we try so hard to provide quality treatment. Let me start off with this first one. I did their PHP for 30 days, which was locked down. It was nice. I got it's it's when I got out of the PHP and transitioned to IOP that I really started to see things fall apart. Um and I didn't know any better at the time, so I didn't know anything was wrong. But during my 30-day PHP stay, I saw my therapist twice. Once for my bio, which I recall lasted about 30, 40 minutes. It was very short. And then I had one one-on-one session that was definitely less than an hour. I can't tell you what we covered whatsoever. We got into nothing. And that was in, in how long? In a 30-day stay. Okay, so I think it's this is a good place to stop. If you're taking notes, first thing is if you're talking to treatment centers or if you're interviewing treatment centers, find out how many times you will see your therapist and when. And then in addition to that, is this therapist licensed? Yeah, so this therapist definitely did have credentials. Um However, I just didn't get to see him. This guy did not know me. You know, and I I look back like in the IOP, I ended up getting a job at LA Fitness right down the road. And he actually went there. And I want to bring this up real quick, too, because this is I think this is a real big part of what makes Rock special is that he was and I I believe in boundaries and what they teach you in school when we went for to be for addictions to Palm Beach State University, like they teach us about professional boundaries, especially in this field. Um, But this guy would walk into the gym, my therapist, I'd wave at him, he'd literally put his head down and walk past me like I didn't exist. And that he probably did that not because that's what he wanted to do, but that's what he was taught in school. Yeah. And I'll be straightforward. This is my opinion. But being that rigid can have a negative effect. And let me say this. Because I want to come back to what they do teach you in school, where prior to getting into any sort of therapeutic processes, um, what do they call them? CBT, DBT? Modalities. Modalities. Thank you. That's the word. Modalities of treatment. The first thing they teach you that you have to do is build rapport. That's therapy 101. And if you don't feel like you can build some sort of connection and trust with someone, and right there, there was none, you know, whatsoever. I, I, I think they take that too far sometimes. Here at Rock, like, we make people feel like human beings. Right. You have to have professional boundaries, but you also have to allow people to feel like human beings. All right, so, like I was saying, it, it really fell apart at the IOP spot. Some of these will blow your mind, Tom, when I share them with you. So... There was a gentleman that went through the PHP with me. He ended up leaving against medical advice. This gentleman was about 45 years old. Keep in mind, I'm a 20-year-old. And I'll, I'll say his first name. His name was Brian. Owned a big construction company. Brian? Yep. Owned a, I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> owned a big construction company up in New Jersey. So he had plenty of funds, et cetera. Um, definitely way more life experience than I did. He was a scary dude. 
huge guy, six foot five, 280 pounds, solid muscle. You could tell he moved some bricks around and did construction. He looked like a hard construction dude. And he ended up leaving against medical advice. Well, I had just moved into IOP. I had a vehicle at the time. This treatment center said, hey, Ben, we got a hold of Brian. He's up in Stewart, Florida, which is about 30 minutes north of where the treatment center I was staying was at. They had me drive up to get him, pick him up at a racetrack gas station. This guy gets in my car with a crack pipe and a tall boy. And I'm sharing this because that is the most unethical thing I could have possibly experienced there. We would never at Rock ask one of our clients to go do what's referred to as a 12-step call or an intervention or go pick up this person that's actively using so you can bring them back to our treatment center. Yeah, I mean, that's that's I, I'm trying to wrap my head around what how you could even justify asking one of your clients to do something like that. Yeah, it was and it's again, not like you did I would be I would not be surprised if <clears throat> we and we've had this situation before where one of our clients say client A relapses and is out using. And one of our current clients has a relationship with this person they were friends or whatever. We have found out after the fact that this client had gone and picked up this client and took him to detox or whatever, but they did it on their own accord. And honestly, we, ha- we found out about it and we're like, you can't do that. You know, you're putting yourself in a very, very, very bad situation. You know, you got 30 days clean and you're going to pick up somebody down off Tamron Avenue. Who's got a crack pipe and a tall boy because you think that you're like, you know, super sober and that you got what it takes and you can handle it. No, I just wanted to help. Oh, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were safe, so on and so forth without even really realizing the serious consequences that can come from that. Mm -hmm. And that that's the real thing. But to actually hear of a treatment center suggesting to you, like, I I don't know, that sounds kind of crazy. Yeah, they, uh, and I, again, I'm 20 years old. I'd never been in treatment. I I had no idea. I knew nothing about recovery whatsoever. So how was I supposed to know that's not the norm? So to give another example, I, I brought this guy, Brian, back. He re-enrolls in treatment. He leaves AMA again with some lady named Cheryl who had a Porsche. Let me get that. And uh, a couple weeks goes by. I'm I'm sleeping in there their sober home that's attached to their IOP intensive outpatient program. Cause now I'm done with the PHP. I'm going to, I think it was three groups a week. One of them was on Saturday mornings, but it's 2 AM. All of a sudden the tech comes knocking on my door. Hey Ben, Brian's outside. He's, he's out of his Seroquel and I was prescribed Seroquel at the time to help me sleep. Yeah. Um, He'd like some of yours. Can can you give me some of Seroquel so I can run it downstairs to him? They literally, which is illegal, you're not allowed to take somebody else's medication, prescribed medication that's not prescribed to you. Their employee came and knocked on my door at 2 a.m. to give this guy, Brian, my medication. This guy, Brian, I don't know what was special about him, but clearly everyone was willing to break rules for this guy. Um Never will a treatment center take someone else's medications to give them to you so that because you're out or your order didn't come into the pharmacy or whatever the case may be, that stuff cannot happen. Yeah, I mean, that's that's uber illegal. Yeah, it's illegal. Why would a treatment center encourage illegal stuff? And another example where I was crying for help and just wasn't getting the message there was a bar- a behavior that I partook in that I had no idea was wrong and nobody said a word to me. So here I am in treatment. I just finished the PHP. I've got, I've probably got 45 days sober in this program. And I end up meeting a girl there and she had one year sober living in their sober house. 
I'm 20 years old. I've never done this before. She was attractive. She was attracted to me. And we we somehow ran into each other at the beach one day. That that was totally random, but we're like, oh, hey, you know, and just exchange phone numbers in a friendly manner. Not one person in that treatment center came forward and said to me, Ben, this isn't a good idea, getting in a rehab romance. In my head, I was like, this girl has a year. She'll teach me how to be sober. Yeah, you're going to get married and everything. What I didn't think through is this girl has a year, and she's still living in the sober house and still seeing the therapist regularly like she was like one of the therapist's little projects if you will long term yeah i should have known something was wrong but again 20 years old no idea what i'm doing i saw her as someone who could show me how and also i got to be in a relationship right i didn't know any better in fact like looking back in a way i look at it as and maybe this is just my perception but like when her therapist found out she was hanging out with me it was almost like i was shunned Rather than anybody saying to me, hey, Ben, you don't want to be doing this. It's called rehab romance. It leads down roads. And I will say this. It crashed and burned really hard. Really hard. It was actually on our one-year anniversary that we went out like on our first official date, to quarter deck. And I just so happened to run into my buddy, another guy, Brian, separate guy. Because uh, I, I was local here, and he handed me a free bag of Coke in the bathroom. You know, did oh, you share okay. it with your girlfriend? I did. Yeah. So I guess she wasn't that super sober. But point <clears> is, is <throat> nobody said to me, Ben, you shouldn't be doing this. I want to say this too. Another thing. When I transferred into IOP, you know how I mentioned I only saw my therapist twice? When I transferred into IOP, I was showing up to these these groups three days a week and... All of a sudden, I hadn't seen my therapist the whole time in IOP. Like three, four weeks went by. I walk in on a Saturday morning. He's sitting in his office. I'm like, I'm like, oh, hey, so and so. I won't put him on blast on here. I do want to say his first name, but I'll refrain from doing so. And oh, Ben, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm in IOP, going to group. He thought I discharged from the program. Had no idea I was still his client. And I'm throwing this out there. Tom, I think maybe if you can chime in on this, your mind just looks kind of blown. (laughs) Like, when you're talking to a place, you don't want to ask about the what size swimming pool they have and if they have big screen TVs and horses. You want to be asking about their clinical competency because this place clearly had none. Like, our therapists here at Rock are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They get in, they see the clients regularly. They get in touch with the families as appropriate. Like it's night and day from what I experienced the first time. Well, I think that there's. Well, let me ask you this: all these experiences, and and just so everybody knows, I, this is the first time hearing this, so <clears throat> I have some questions for myself. Is this all these experiences that you had? Are these all isolated to that one center? Yes. So, and you obviously had experiences with other treatment centers afterwards. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other instances or was this place kind of the, like, worst of the worst? This was the worst of the worst, but I didn't know any better at the time. And I asked that because what I want to say now is I don't want us, I don't want people to listen to this and think, oh my God gosh, like this is what treatment centers are out there doing, because that's, I think, extremely, that's far from the truth. Uh, Most treatment centers don't operate this way, but for us to sit here and say that none of them do would be foolish. I mean, there's a lot of treatment centers out there that they, this sounds pretty par for the course. I mean, but when you actually hear it and you speak to people, in this case, me and you, that you've experienced this, it's really hard to believe because I didn't have any of these experiences. I went to Lakeview up in Jacksonville, shout out Lakeview. They were phenomenal. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was great. It was a good program. My therapist, I could tell she cared, uh, very organized, very almost militant in a way. 
You know, you knew where you had to be. I had to schedule every single day. There were texts around. Everybody knew where they were going, what time group was till. Everything to the T from the moment you woke up to the time lights out. Everything was, you know, a really, really good experience. And then you see and hear these types of things. It's really disheartening. But I say that with, you know, I don't, that, uh, this isn't, we're not, we're painting with a very broad brush here. Yeah. You know, most treatment centers are, are not this, but, um, I want to reiterate what Tom's saying. It would be irresponsible of me to not say there's a lot of good treatment centers out there. There are some that are like this, Yeah. but yeah, I don't want to paint a picture that treatment centers are horrific and you got to be scared to death when calling them because that's not the case. I'm not trying to make that impression. So if I have, my apologies. No, no, no. And I don't, I don't think that you were. I think it was just, I wanted to bring that up because, you know, a lot of people that, you know, listeners of this, people that watch this, they have either gone to treatment or are going to treatment or they know somebody that needs to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we wanted to record this more for educational purposes of things to look out for. Now, a lot of the things that you experienced, you experienced inside the treatment center. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have known this stuff had you not gone, gone. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't edit that out. Yeah. That's good. Go, you wouldn't have experienced had you not gone to that treatment center. So. Again, though, this is this brings up a good point. We learn from other people's mm -hmm. experiences. We, you know, hear other people's experiences. And that's we again. And since day one of this podcast, it's been very well known that we're just talking to you guys and girls based off of our experiences. So you take it for what it's worth. Ben or I were not licensed clinical social workers. We're not licensed mental health counselors. We're not medical doctors. We're just a couple of dudes that have a long, lot of sobriety time and have been working in this space for a very long time. And when you think you've seen it all or you've heard it all, you hear stuff like this. And so we want you to be educated enough to know what questions to ask because you can. And I, and I distinctly remember this when I recorded this other episode years ago, and I'm glad we decided to do this because it's an opportunity for a refresher. You, you, I remember in this episode, I, I, I said, you want to interview the treatment centers, but you don't want to paralyze yourself mm -hmm. because I've, I've taken calls from people and I'm one of 10 treatment centers that they've called and they ask a bajillion questions. And although I don't, I don't see a, a lot wrong with that. I, I would say, and I would suggest to people find a handful, two, three, maybe four treatment centers that, you know, scan the websites, you know, see if it's something relative to what you're looking for and just stick to those three or four. And stay within those three or four and come up with a list of questions that you want to ask each treatment center and ask the same questions at each treatment center and just write down the answers and stuff like that. And one of them was, are the therapists licensed? Because there are some treatment centers out there that they'll literally put anybody in there to run a group and they'll have the one licensed clinician sign off on the note. Because technically, that can fall within standards, you know, and all states are different. Here in Florida, you're supposed to have some sort of degree, whether it be a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in a relative field, and you can run that group and have a licensed clinician sign off on it. It's not always the case. Ben and I have cert we're certified addictions counselors through the Florida Certification Board. So technically, we're able to run group and a licensed clinician needs to sign off on it. But there are some places out there that they'll have any Tom, Dick or Harry. If you got 60 days clean and you can string a few words together, hey, run this group and we're going to have somebody sign off on it. And a lot of times they get away with it mm -hmm. because the policing of it isn't the greatest, you know, and it's 
lot of times they get away with it for a long time. So that's one. Ask them if they're, are the therapists licensed? And if they're not licensed, are they at least registered? Are they registered interns? Or are they certified addictions counselors or certified addictions professionals? And then another question that I uh, say to ask is, what's the, the client to therapist ratio? You know, if I have, you know, one therapist, how many people are on their caseload? How many people are they accountable to each week? I've, I've heard people, I've heard therapists having 20 to 30 clients on their caseload. Now, technically speaking, each one of those people are supposed to have an hour individual session, plus all the documentation that goes behind that. If you have a caseload of 20 people or 30 people, somebody's getting the short end of the stick and it's not going to be the therapist. You know, some of their, the sessions are going to be chopped down to 20 minutes maybe because mm-hmm. you can't fit all these sessions in realistically. Our therapists here at Rock max out at 10 clients and that is if they have 10 clients on and that's all levels of care, that's PHP, IOP and outpatient. When they have 10 they're busy and they work 40, 45, sometimes 50 hours. And on top of that, they're running a group. So I say that with, you know, if, if asked that question, how, what's the client to therapist ratio? Because that can, that can tell you a lot too. And a lot of times, Ben, the, the, you know, you get these admissions people on the other end of the line and they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. They don't even know the real answer. If you call a lot of the some, not a lot, but some of these treatment centers, you get some kid on the other end of the line. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the answers, but he knows the answers you want to hear because I guarantee you he's gone through training. He's fielded enough calls. There's a chance that he gets paid based off of, you know, how many people he brings in or she. And so it's a sales position, you know? And again, though, I'm not saying that call rooms are bad or that you can't have these, like a lot of times they're necessary, but you know, sometimes the people that you're talking to on the other end of the line, they don't know here at rock. And this episode is turning into just one big, like plug for us, which is fine. When you're calling into admissions, you get one of three people, either myself, Ben, or destiny. That is it. And we, we field the call from, from day one to the second you enter into the program. And there's, we know every single thing about this program. There's a question that you can't ask that we don't have the answer to and have proof to back it up. And then the the last thing that I'll say is if you have an opportunity to tour the facility, whichever facility it is that you're calling, you ask them because reality is, and I don't even care if you have the opportunity and you have the resources, say you're calling from Pennsylvania and the treatment centers in Florida. If you have the opportunity to, to tour the place, do it because Definitely. I can make a website look However, I want it to look, I can put the beaches on there. I can put swimming pools on there. I can put five star pictures of dining food on there. I can make it look and present however I want and I can make it say whatever I want because I want you to come. But when you actually step foot in the door, does it line up? And a lot of times it doesn't. You know, I'll tell you, there's a again, I, I, what I was talking about earlier with making people feel like human beings and this uh, where I want to go with this is you also have to be realistic about what's available to you. You know, there's places where I where I've walked in larger places because I get to tour a lot of places with my position and because I want to get a feel for what's out there. You know, if, if there's somebody we can't help at rock, I want to be able to say, yes, I know this place. I know these people. You know, there's been places that I've walked into and 
I could tour myself without anybody saying hi. Like I could just walk in the front door and yeah. no one, you come here to rock and you're like swarmed by our staff. There's a, there's a human aspect to it, but where I'm going with this is, is one thing that Tom and I have to find out and, and destiny from people is realistically, we, we talk about time, energy, and resources. And I, I want to talk about resources for a second because I've had several people that I've helped get into other treatment centers in this past few weeks. And I'm just going to call it what it is. I believe in having open and transparent conversations. A lot of times you get a lower end insurance policy off the marketplace. Um, one, for instance, down here will be Florida Blue. Their substance abuse coverage is terrible in the state of Florida. And there's only selective places, programs that will take that insurance. And basically, and I had this discussion with the mother the other day because, you know, she was jumping. She sent me her insurance and I said, you know, and I t I always tell everybody up front, if I can't help you directly at Rock, I'll do my best to help you indirectly and help you find the best place that we can find for your, in this case, son. And, you know, I, we went over the insurance stuff and I, I recommended three places. You know, these are the places that I know of locally that will take this insurance. There's not very many of them. And, you know, she jumped on, looked at the review. She's like, oh, this one's only three star. I also want to bring it up that we have to be realistic in what's available to people resource wise. I want to be able to send them to the best place possible for the resources that they have. Now, you know, the mom had, had looked at the reviews again, and she saw one had three stars. She's like, oh, that one only has three stars. I don't know. I'm, I'm like, well, look at look at the few others that have that take that insurance and they're even less. You know, let's just call it what it is. Like when when you have a lower end insurance policy, what these places have to do is they get reimbursed less money. Therefore, their therapists have to have more clients to be able to meet their overhead. They're, they're not able to do the bells and whistles. And I'm a firm believer and kind of another part of the reason I wanted to share my previous quote unquote bad experience in treatment is I do believe people can get sober anywhere. I really believe that. I You know, again, I've been to state funded places and I know people who have gone to the lowest of the low end treatment centers when they were ready to get sober they took the resources that that place had and they got sober, you know? So you also have to be honest and, and work within the confines of what is available too. And let me throw this out there. Tom and myself, Destiny, I know other people in the field as well that'll say the same thing that we say. If we can't help you directly, we'll help you find the best place possible for you. We do not mind doing that. If you wanna, if you wanna call Tom and I and, and and Destiny and say, "Hey, this is what we have. Can you let me know about some options?" You're utilizing three people who are familiar with substance abuse treatment, right? And we know a lot of the treatment centers, both locally, both nationally. So, utilize resources like us so that we can help recommend a place. And the other benefit, I told this mom with this place that I ended up suggesting her son go to. I said, one of the good things about this is you now have me in your corner. I have people that work at this treatment center. If, you're, if, you're, if you feel like at any point something's not going par for course at this treatment center, guess what? You can call me and I can call my contact and say, hey, man, I referred this guy to you and I told him you were going to give him good treatment. What's going on over here? Let me let me see what's going on. A lot of the time it's it's nothing. You know, nothing's going wrong. Just clients having a bad day, stuff like that. But I will realistically and Tom will do the same. Check in and see make sure that client is getting everything that they said because Tom and I don't want to be referring somebody to some place and them not have a good experience. Yeah. And there's other people out there. There's interventionists, stuff along those lines. So it, it is useful to find someone who's familiar with this field. And, you know, a lot of times, this is just my opinion. I'll throw it out there. If if you get a hold of a place 
that it's like, oh, we don't take that insurance, sorry, click, and they hang up on you, they probably weren't weren't the right place anyway. When you get the person on the end of the phone that, that cares and they're like, hold on, don't hang up, we don't take your insurance, but let me help you find a place that will. Yeah, I mean, it's just, a, you know, it's about being a good good person at that point. I mean, there has been times where, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, I, I am willing to go above and beyond for every single phone call that I take. But if I don't have anything going on and I'm just sitting at home watching a basketball game, which is very rare, I'll take the extra step and, and make sure that, that we find something or at least point you in the right direction. You know, but if I'm putting my kids to bed, you know, and you want to have a full blown therapy session and, you know, in the end, you want me to give you a bunch of like, I, sorry, I can't, you know, but you can call me back tomorrow and I'll always, and you know, nine times out of 10, they don't, you know, but you know, cause Ben and I have to, uh, you know, and that's, it's funny because in the positions that we're in, especially with the podcast and with YouTube and our everyday job. You know, it's a lot. You know, we're fielding calls all day, every day. And it ha- we Ben and I have to, and I'm better at this than Ben is. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> setting boundaries with ourselves. Like me, it's easy for me to, you know, listen, I'm sorry. I don't have time for this. Not that I don't want to have time for it. I just can't right now. You get Ben on the phone, you know, <laughs> he'll he'll talk to you for hours. His, his kids might be starving. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm in trouble with the wife. Yeah. But he'll, he'll always put you first, but no, I think this was a good episode. It was needed to be done. Um, you know, again, like I said, in the very beginning of the episode, if you have questions, it doesn't matter your situation. If you yourself or somebody that, you know, is struggling with addiction and you just want some guidance or you want, you know, you want to have a quick conversation with us to see if you're at least heading in the right direction or, you're thinking the right thoughts or whatever the case is, just send us an email and, and you know, we'll get your number and we'll connect with you. Tom at real recovery and uh pen, uh, pen, pen. I can't talk to Dude, you. I don't know what's going on. You're getting old. It must be 39 kicking in today. Jeez. Ben at real recovery You have anything else? I don't. All right. Well, happy birthday, Ben. Yeah, happy you birthday, doing anything Tom. tonight? Yeah. Whitney actually made uh, reservations at Ruth Chris tonight. Ruth Chris. And uh, got us tickets. Her, Wes, and I were going to go see John Wick 4. John Wick 4. You know what I'm doing? What are you doing? My son has a soccer game at 730. Ah, So I'm going to go sit there, watch him play soccer. You know, maybe go get some ice cream after. You know, some Rocky Road or uh, Earth. You ever have Earth? No, that sounds good. It's just it sounds muddy. It's blue. It's blue? blue ice cream with all like the candy bars in it and stuff. Interesting. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, like I said just a minute ago, you can reach out to us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we're trying to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see y'all later.